Uh, so I'm going to go over in the next hour um, emerging path a module on, mer on emerging pathogen detection and identification. And so uh, my name is Aaron Petkow, and I'm a uh, bioinformatician at the uh, National Microbiology Lab here in Canada uh, with the Public Health Agency of Canada. And I've been, while well, working in bioinformatics at the National Microbiology Lab since, I mean, since, well, I started as a student since in 2008, uh, but I've been working full-time uh, following uh, following that student, those student work terms since around 2010, uh, and have been involved in a variety of projects, though all related to microbial genomics and bioinformatics analysis, uh, in particular for um, infectious disease epidemiology. Uh, and so my background is in computer science. Uh, and so I've been involved quite a bit in designing or developing a number of different software packages over the years. Uh, and, uh, and also doing uh, a lot of computational biology and data analysis. Um, uh, so I'm going to be presenting to you, uh, not on anything I've developed, but on, uh, software that I've run and used previously for, uh, um, uh, pathogen detection and identification, as well as some additional background material. So the learning objectives of this uh, module is to learn the processes and techniques used to detect existing infectious diseases, uh, and then understanding metagenomic sequencing, in particular shotgun metagenomic sequencing, and the use of the Kraken and Kraken 2 software for data analysis, and also how to use the Kraken uh, uh, crack into uh, software for identifying new pathogens using metagenomic sequencing data. Uh, so just as a bit of a background material, uh, uh, novel and emerging infectious diseases uh, refers to diseases that have not previously occurred in human hosts, uh, have occurred in humans before, but only infected small isolated populations or have occurred through time, but only recently been recognized as distinct diseases. And so the figure on the right here just shows uh, it's, well, this is deaths uh, from uh, major epidemics over the past uh, 20 years, uh, of which, I mean, the most recent and ongoing one is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has the higher bar, but there's been a lot of other uh, uh, infectious diseases, uh, some of which have been emerging or, or re-emerging diseases over the past 20 years, uh, including the original SARS virus back in the early 2000s. And increasing, uh, in general, uh, uh, and this was mentioned in uh, previous modules, but increasing global activity as well as climate change increase the chance for novel pathogen emergence and spread. Uh, so this figure here is just showing uh, uh, just the basically flight paths uh, in the world over uh, roughly uh, almost or 90 years. It's from 1930 to 2020. And uh, I mean, as expected, uh, the world is quite a bit more interconnected now than it was 100 years ago. And this means that there is an increasing chance of Seeing uh, novel or emerging infectious diseases and existing diagnostic methods may fail to detect an emerging pathogen. Uh, so kind of giving a general overview and leading into uh, existing methods for detecting uh, different pathogens, uh, I want to just introduce infectious disease surveillance, uh, who, which the purpose of which is primarily to either describe the current burden and epidemiology of disease, to monitor disease trends, uh, or to identify new outbreaks or new pathogens. Uh, and so there's three different categories. Well, there's a number of different divisions, uh, different people have divided uh, surveillance uh, up into. Uh, but one way of dividing that up is into three different categories, mainly disease-specific surveillance, 
syndromic surveillance and event-based surveillance. Uh, uh, so disease specific is uh, well focused on gathering information that is very specific to particular diseases, uh, either through lab reports or, or, or genomic sequencing or other techniques. Uh, syndromic surveillance is more focused on um, gathering more, uh, well, I introduced that in this slide, disease-specific surveillance uh, is looking for specific diseases. Syndromic surveillance is looking for non-specific health indicators. So as an example, uh, school or work absenteeism uh, uh, or um, the uh, drug sales from different pharmacies, uh, which are all uh, not necessarily associated with any particular disease, but could be an indication of some emerging infectious disease event or, or something else going on. And both of these types of surveillance involve structured data. That is to say, there are certain reports or standard, standard reports or structure to the data. Uh, Whereas event-based surveillance is more related to unstructured data, for example, news reports uh, to provide early warnings of disease. So this is actually a table showing uh, uh, the, part, the use of the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, and, which does uh, event-based surveillance and uh, the um, sources of information that were used by this network to give an early indication, for example, of the COVID-19 pandemic based on reports of uh, uh, viral pneumonia of unknown origin or for MPOX based on uh, uh, government health notice reports. So this uh, can give you quite an early indication of some sort of disease event, uh, but you still need further investigation uh, if you're using this sort of general data to confirm, identify, and characterize the cause of that disease. Uh, as an example here, there was many publications early on with COVID-19 where uh, there was a large amount of interest in sequencing uh, the virus or sequencing uh, metagenomics data from that virus, uh, from uh, people who were infected to attempt to identify the uh, novel pathogen causing that disease. Uh, so going back then to infectious disease surveillance, we're going to focus mainly on disease-specific surveillance, and in particular, we're going to focus on um, uh, laboratory-based uh, methods uh, for gathering data about uh, uh, related to pathogens. So this uh, figure here, that you can kind of divide up this the way you. Um, gather this data based on the source of that data. So as an example, clinical samples uh, um, uh, can be used to, uh, uh, or you can do surveillance of clinical samples, which would involve uh, 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 taking the sample and culturing uh, uh, um, that particular, infect particular infectious agents and performing additional diagnostic testing. For example, to identify the subtypes of that uh, infectious agent, uh, uh, or identify the particular pathogen uh, and produce reports, which could then feed into some surveillance system and give an, er and give an indication of, uh, of outbreaks of disease. Uh, you can also perform surveillance using foodborne samples where uh, food, um, genomic material is extracted from food, uh, uh, cultured, and again, pathogen identification uh, and typing uh, using a variety of lab-based methods or uh, genomic sequencing methods can be used to generate reports which can feed into different surveillance systems. Uh, the same with environmental, where uh, there is, <clears throat> or where you can gather uh, information from the environment, for example, uh, wastewater uh, uh, samples, and again, um, uh, perform a variety of lab-based testing to attempt to identify uh, and characterize uh, uh, or quantify how much of a pathogen is within that particular wastewater sample and produce reports for surveillance purposes. Uh, uh, however, these all require some sort of laboratory-based testing techniques to 
that are specific to a particular pathogen. Uh, so it may involve uh, different uh, different uh, typing methods, or it may involve uh, a form of, some form of culturing to uh, uh, identify and isolate a particular pathogen uh, to be used, for example, for sequencing and then characterization that way. Uh, so going a bit into some more details about some of these uh, traditional lab-based pathogen detection techniques. Uh, they can involve uh, well, nucleotide acid application, serotyping. Uh, I mentioned culturing is often used, uh, or uh, methods in proteomics, micros microscopy. Uh, and some of these I know have been introduced uh, in the previous modules. Uh, uh, the first one I'll just mention is uh, okay. The first one I'll just mention is uh, nucleotide acid-based amplification techniques, uh, and this is something that people are likely familiar with, at least uh, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, since it was used to uh, 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 attempt to identify all possible or as many possible cases uh, as uh, we can of the uh, of people infected with COVID-19. And this uh, involves basically amplification of particular uh, signatures contained within the, the genomic sample uh, related to uh, uh, ge the genome of the pathogen of interest. So for example, real-time quantitative PCR or RT-PCR uh, may involve um, collecting a sample. So for example, a nasal swab and extracting, well, for COVID-19, extracting the RNA uh, from that swab, uh, converting the RNA to complementary DNA or cDNA, and then performing PCR amplification uh, on that, uh, on that particular, on the RNA using primers, which uniquely bind to the uh, uh, regions associated with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then, uh, uh, through repeated PCR amplification cycles, you can measure the fluorescence of a particular dye that binds to uh, binds to the DNA that is being amplified. And this, through repeated cycles, gives you a plot uh, of the fluorescence intensity. Uh, and if that intensity uh, plot um, basically increases uh, exponentially, at least initially, uh, uh, and then levels off here and uh, surpasses a particular threshold, then that is a positive sample. Whereas if it is just a flat line here, it is a negative sample. Uh, and not only that, but the particular um, cycle where this threshold is meet, matched can then be used to quantify the um, amount of the RNA within that particular sample or the amount of the virus in that sample. So a lower CT cycle would indicate that uh, the threshold of RNA was met earlier, and so there was more uh, RNA in the original sample, that is more virus in the original sample. Uh, another um, la traditional laboratory-based uh, surveillance technique for identifying particular pathogens is multilocal sequence typing, which was introduced uh, in the previous modules. Uh, but just as a recap, the uh, uh, classical multilobe sequence typing is based on six or seven or maybe a few more genes, uh, uh, where these uh, different alleles of these genes can be used to assign a particular sequence type or subtype of a particular bacteria, for example. So in this case, in this figure here, uh, for a genome or sample A, B, and C, uh, there are roughly seven different uh, genes or different loci that are being investigated for the multilocal sequence typing. Each one gets assigned a unique integer. If there is any genomic variant within this uh, uh, within this particular gene, and then the combination of all these uh, allelic identifiers, so one, three, four, and so on, get assigned into a unique sequence type. Uh, and then a new combination gets assigned a new sequence type identifier. 
And then this can be used to essentially identify and classify subtypes of particular bacteria. Uh, and this can be performed uh, uh, through a variety of methods, but it can include, for example, genome, whole genome sequencing, which can then, the gen well, the genomic sequence can then be investigated to identify these particular uh, loci and alleles of the loci. Uh, this can, was then extended uh, later on to uh, include basically hundreds or thousands of genes uh, within a genome. Uh, through the use of core genome MLST or whole genome MLST, uh, which again, core genome means that you are looking at the genes that are found within all or at least most of the uh, 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 particular uh, organism in question, whereas whole genome may uh, include genes that uh, aren't necessarily part of the core genome. That is to say, some of the uh, organisms that you're investigating, some of the species may be missing particular genes. Uh, but in any, in any case, these allow you basically a very detailed and fine-grained uh, classification system that goes beyond just uh, looking at maybe a small fraction of the genome, but essentially looking at the entire genome of uh, a particular bacteria and using that to uh, classify and cluster different bacteria and identify different subtypes or different uh, clusters. Uh, another type of all traditional lab based uh, uh, pathogen identification or at least identifying uh, particular subtypes of individual pathogens is serotyping which is subtyping based on uh, cell surface molecules. Uh, so basically whether or not, uh, so if you mix those, uh, particular, a particular, um, type of bacteria or subtype of bacteria, uh, with different, uh, uh antibodies and you see a re reaction that, that indicates that there is some unique combination of antigens, uh, uh, on the surface of that cell. And these, uh, uh, differences between these different antigens can be used to then classify and type and identify uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, pathogens. And this can, again, also be performed if you're doing whole genome sequencing, where you can investigate just using sequence-based comparison methods, uh, investigate and look for the uh, particular sequence of the coding for the different antigens and use that sequence to uh, identify the serotype. Uh, and then finally, another method for uh, uh, that is used for uh, identifying different pathogens and classifying these different pathogens is PFGE, uh, uh, where the idea here is that a particular stretch of DNA uh, is cut into different fragments uh, using different enzymes, uh, which will uh, basically fragment this uh, strand of DNA into a variety of fragments of different sizes. And depending on the variation in the original genome, these cuts will occur at different locations, which produce different fragment sizes. And then these fragment sizes can then be uh, essentially separated out on a uh, gel, uh, uh, which you can see in this banding pattern right here. And then uh, basically by comparing the different banding patterns with each other and looking for the presence or absence of different banding patterns uh, across a whole collection of samples, you can then cl um, cluster the different, uh, the different uh, bacteria uh, that were run through this PFG process, which is shown in, in the dendrogram up here. So some of the advantages and disadvantages of these traditional diagnostic methods for pathogen detection is that while well, advantages are specificity, uh, basically since they involve um, a large amount of these uh, detection methods involve targeting either particular 
subtypes of uh, 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 pathogens, or at least be able to classify, identify, and classify different subtypes of pathogens, or uh, targeting a particular pathogen in general, for example, qPCR for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and so it, this allows you to uh, uh, more easily differentiate and extract a signal from that pathogen amongst the noise of all the background material that is within the sample, whether that's uh, host genomic material uh, from a human, for example, or whether that's environmental genomic material. Uh, however, the disadvantage is that if a pathogen has evolved too much, then you might miss it. Uh, 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 so it might not be it might, for example, it might not fit into the existing classification system you have set up for subtyping different pathogens, or it might not even be detected at all. And so this is a large disadvantage in particular for emerging pathogens, where or emerging or in particular novel pathogens, where you would expect there would be a large amount of differences to the existing pathogens we've already identified and classified. And so this is where then uh, shotgun metagenomic sequencing can be used uh, as a way to um, better handle that sort of situation. Uh, so with shotgun metagenomic sequencing, it's a genomic sequencing technique that provides an unbiased survey of nucleotide acid contents. Uh, that unbiased here meaning that you aren't necessarily, for example, um, uh, isolating and culturing partic for particular bacteria, you're just taking the collection of uh, nucleic acids within a sample and uh, uh, fragmenting them and sequencing whatever it is that you happen to get uh, without amplifying particular targets, for example. The nu nucleotide acid can be DNA or RNA. Uh, with RNA, uh, often you would uh, first convert it to complementary DNA before uh, sequencing. Uh, for clinical metagenomics, uh, the specimen will contain both the host nucleotide acid plus the microbial nucleotide acid, which can include the microcommensal or uh, microbes that are uh, just normally found within you, as well as any potential pathogens. And so there's a lot of data in there. Uh, uh, and so you need unique techniques to be able to uh, uh, sift through that large amounts of data if you wish to use that to identify particular pathogens. Additionally, metagenomic samples can also contain contaminating DNA from sources external to the example, to the sample. So this is, figure is just, uh, this. it's from this paper here, but I'm just using it as a comparison of culture-dependent genomics to metagenomics. So in both cases, you are collecting a biological sample, but with culture-dependent methods, you are um, isolating pure cultures of particular path or particular microbes, uh, 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 and then using those and sequencing those pure cultures. Uh, by first extracting the DNA. Whereas with culture-independent methods, that is meta metagenomics, you have a complex microbial community, which can be derived from a host uh, uh, that is human, that could be derived from environmental or food-based uh, samples. Uh, and then you extract the DNA uh, or convert RNA to DNA uh, <clears throat> to complementary DNA. And this gives you a whole wide variety of DNA fragments or DNA from a variety of different microbes that aren't really separated in any meaningful sense. So when you perform sequencing with metagenomic sequencing, you end up getting reads which match to uh, a whole wide variety of different microbes or uh, different organisms uh, such as human genomics or plant genomics, or plants, sources, or whatever, uh, uh, whatever else may happen to be in that particular biological sample. Whereas for isolate genomics, because you have ahead of time isolated pure cultures of the microbes in question, uh, the re you can uh, 
basically know that all the sequence reads belong to that uh, particular uh, clonal colony of that micro, which gives you a bit more information that can be used to, for example, assemble a, a, a draft or potentially nearly complete, depending on the length of the reads, uh, genome of that particular micro. <clears throat> Uh, whereas with metagenomics, you need to, or metagenomics in particular, if you wish to do assembly of metagenomics data, there's a lot more, uh, you'll end up getting a lot more mixture of data, <clears throat> and it's a lot more difficult to extract full genomes from metagenomic samples. Uh, so some one thing about metagenomic samples, as mentioned before, is that it doesn't necessarily contain just the microbe or even pathogen in question that you're looking for. It contains uh, an unbiased sample of whatever, whatever genomic material was, if it was within that sample. And often you aren't interested in particular, uh, 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 particular sets of genomic material. For example, you often aren't interested in human uh, human genomic material when sequencing uh, samples derived clinical samples uh, where you're interested in identifying a particular pathogen. So there's a number of different methods for reducing the amount of host genomic material within your sample. Uh, uh, and the amount of host genomic material can also depend quite a lot on the source of that sample or specimen type. Uh, two main methods of host reduction are wet lab and computational methods. Uh, with wet lab methods, you are either enriching the uh, <clears throat> you're either enriching the microbial nucleic, nucleic acid or reducing the host nucleic acid. Um, and works best again with samples with high microbial content. Uh, since, for example, host nucleic acid reduction may also impact the amount of genomic, the genomic content within the microbial communities as well. There's a number of different methods available, CPG island hybridization, RNA depletion, polyA selection, or selective host lysis, and DNA degradation. So the figure at the right here is just from a paper, which is uh, going over a number of evaluating a number of different methods for selective host lysis and DNA degradation, uh, where the white uh, bar here is the human DNA and the colored bars are uh, microbial DNA, either from bacteria or viruses. And it's, again, evaluating a number of different methods to, uh, or component compounds to uh, degrade or, yeah, degrade the host cells, in this case, human, and uh, degrade the genomic material from those host cells, uh, which you can see does both remove a large amount of the human genomic material, but depending on the compounds you use can also impact the uh, microbial genomic material as well. Uh, so that is all the methods for host re reduction in uh, the wet lab samples. However, there is also computational approaches you can uh, use. Uh, and mainly that is to map host, uh, map your reads to the host genome and remove any reads that match to that host genome. Uh, and you could also use a combination of these different methods as well. Uh, so that is one potential issue, issue with metagenomic sequencing. Another issue is contamination. Uh, mainly that nucleic acid external to the sample can be introduced. Uh, this can happen at all stages of sample preparation, whether it's collection, extraction, library preparation. Uh, and there's a wide variety of sources that contamination can come from. Uh, and so one way of handling or dealing with contamination is to make sure to use negative or uh, controls uh, when performing sequencing to just verify that there is no contamination in the uh, sequence data. Uh, so once you have the, uh, uh, once you have your uh, 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 library prepared, uh, you can then uh, perform metagenomic sequencing and the overall process for using this metagenomic sequences 
<clears throat> for pathogen detection is, uh, well, your nucleic acid gets sequenced into reads, which come from a wide variety or a wide mixture of different uh, species that were found within that biological sample. Uh, <clears throat> these reads can then be directly uh, 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 assigned, basically each individual read can be assigned a particular taxonomic uh, assigned to a particular taxon or taxonomic category. Uh, and this can be then used to investigate what sort of uh, um, genomic material is within your sample. Uh, alternatively or optionally, you can perform a metagenomics assembly where the reads are combined together into larger fragments, uh, uh, larger contiguous fragments. And this metagenomics assembly can then also be uh, 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 or that contigs from that assembly can then also be assigned to different taxonomic categories to investigate the uh, 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 microbial and uh, 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 other uh, other organisms within that uh, genomic sample. <clears throat> Alternatively, the uh, uh, contigs can then also be binned uh, based on uh, relatedness or based on a variety of methods to attempt to um, uh, organize these contigs into particular, uh, uh, into all the contigs associated with a particular species. And this can be used to then, uh, while both be used as input for taxonomic assignments, as well as it can also then be used to, for example, investigate the genomic or the genetic content of a particular organism. Uh, which may be broken up into a number of different contexts. Uh, however, and in any event, no matter which uh, uh, different method you use, uh, there's always this uh, extra step of interpretation of that data, which can itself be uh, uh, challenging. So describing a bit more in detail about these two optional steps, metagenome assembly and binning, uh, metagenomic assembly can be uh, performed using a wide variety of assemblers. There was a number of them that are uh, uh, either were designed for or uh, 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 enhancements to existing genomic assemblers for metagenomic data sets, such as MegHit and Metaspades and many others. Uh, many of these assemblers are de Bruyne graph assemblers, uh, meaning that they break your reads up into different fragments uh, of size k called a kamer and construct uh, a variety, construct graphs from these uh, kamers uh, and then use those graphs to uh, uh, and basically following paths through that graph to uh, output a contig. Uh, so once you have your metagenomic assembly, another optional step is this binning step, which groups contigs uh, based on shared characteristics. So a number of different methods include look, examining differences in tetranucleotide frequencies or differences in abundances or codon usage of these different contigs. The goal being to group these contigs into uh, uh, different, uh, basically group and organize these contigs into different species. And um, when you go through the process of it, doing a metagenomics assembly to uh, construct a number of different contigs and then binning those contigs into the uh, different uh, species collections, you end up with a metagenome assembled genome, which can then be used for uh, additional analyses. Uh, primarily, the idea here being that because you have your contigs grouped into different species, uh, um, uh, you may be able to then, well, you can then do gene prediction and gene annotation to investigate the, uh, the in different genes uh, within particular species. Uh, but you also may be able to um, identify, for example, different bins associated with different species that may not match with a uh, existing reference database. Uh, and so could could indicate a novel pathogen or at least something not represented in your reference database. Uh, and in any case, whether you're just using doing metagenomic assembly or whether you're uh, proceeding forward to construct a metagenome assembled genome, 
Uh, you can use that information for taxonomic assignments uh, or for phylogenetic analysis. Uh, phylogenetic analysis can be performed, for example, by uh, searching for and extracting particular um, targets or particular genes and performing multiple sequence alignments of these different genes among the different uh, species bins, for example, uh, uh, among, other, among other ways. So whether you're using directly uh, the reads for taxonomic assignments or the assemblies for taxonomic assignments, uh, the idea in general is you want to well, assign that genomic content and identify which taxon or which organism uh, or collections of organisms that uh, uh, genomic content belongs to. And this can be performed in a number of different taxonomic ranks. So for example, you can identify the species a reed belongs to, but it could also be associated with a genus, family, order, and so on. Uh, and this is typically performed by having a pre-existing reference database of known taxa and then uh, uh, matching the reads or the context to that database to, to perform taxonomic assignment. Uh, so since there can be a number of different ways of performing taxonomic assignment, there is a question of which method is the best or which you should use and what are some of the different um, um, ways you would measure uh, which methods or measure or some of the different considerations for taxonomic assignments. Mainly you want it to be fast and sensitive and specific. <clears throat> Uh, so one way uh, you could do uh, taxonomic assignment is it is just directly using BLAST. For example, you could take all the reads and use BLAST to align the reads to a reference database uh, of uh, reference genomes from a wide variety of uh, wide variety of taxonomic categories. Uh, you could fine tune the BLAST parameters to tune specificity and sensitivity. However, uh, especially if you're looking or trying to perform taxonomic assignment directly from reads, uh, BLAST is often not necessarily fast enough. It's not really the best or uh, yeah, fastest tool for that job, uh, uh, though it could be used if you uh, perform this, uh, genomic metagenomic assemblies prior to that. Uh, um, and there is the additional challenge, if you're just directly using BLAST alone, of managing the data and also of basically sorting out from these BLAST reports which taxonomic category a particular read or content belongs to. Uh, for example, with BLAST, uh, if you took a particular read and uh, uh, used BLAST to align it to a reference database of a wide variety of organisms, you may get matches to well, a wide variety of different species. And these matches may be all very similar to each other uh, or even identical across different species. For example, if the particular read was derived from uh, genomic content that is common among the different species. And so there's this additional question of which taxonomic category should you assign that particular read? Uh, uh, which is represented here, where, again, you may have your read matched to a wide variety of species, but it may derive from a region that's common to all, all species within a particular genus. And so there's additional post-processing you may need to do on the BLAST reports if you wish to use BLAST for taxonomic assignments. Uh, so there are better solutions out there that not only surpass BLAST in performance for processing millions or tens of millions of reads and metagenomic samples, uh, but also do this additional post-processing to sort out which taxonomic rank particular reads or contexts should be assigned to. And the one we're going to discuss here in this uh, presentation is Kraken. Uh, so Kraken, uh, which was originally published in 2014, 
is a method that is uh, does not rely on alignments. So it's uh, not doesn't necessarily have to do all the work that Blast would be doing when it's doing alignment. Uh, but it's a method for very quickly uh, assigning taxonomic uh, labels to metagenomic sequence data, uh, or just in general, any sequence data. So the original software was published in 2014. However, an updated version, Kraken 2, was published in 2019, which significantly reduced the uh, database size is required for, for a Kraken analysis, the database being the database of reference sequences from all of the different, uh, from your large collection of taxonomic categories that are being used to classify reads. So giving a brief, going over briefly uh, how Kraken works, uh, it is again, primarily based on KMERS uh, and a KMER being a uh, process by which you break up a read or uh, a contig or any other stretch of sequence into small fragments uh, of a fixed size uh, uh, with K being that particular size. So in this case, K is four. Uh, and to generate the collection of KMERS from a sequence, such as a read, uh, you can then basically slide, basically use a sliding window method. For example, you pick the first four nucleotides, uh, form the first KMER, and then you slide over by one to generate the second KMER, which is the next four nucleotides, and slide over by one again to generate the third KMER, which is the third uh, set of four nucleotides. And this collection of all of these uh, uh, strings of substrings of four from this read form your collection of KMERS derived from the read. So Kraken, uh, both in constructing the database as well as in uh, uh, taxonomic assignment of reads or other sequences, is all based on KMERS. So to build a Kraken database, imagine, for example, for a a number of different organisms that you're interested in representing in that Kraken database. You've ahead of time taken the sequence, for example, for an owl, and divided it up into all of its uh, 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 substrings of size K, mainly all of the KMERS, in this case, all of the uh, KMERS of size four. And you've done that for all the different organisms, all the different organisms you want to include in the Kraken database. Uh, so to construct this Kraken database, what you would do is for every KMER, you then go and look up where, basically for every KMER associated with a particular or organism, uh, if it is, you assign it to that particular category in the taxonomic tree. For example, if a particular KMER only matches to OWL and nothing else in the tree, you would assign it to OWL. Uh, for a KMER that only matches to snake, you would assign it to snake. Uh, yeah. But if there's a KMER that is in common among a snake and a turtle, then it gets assigned to the uh, least common ancestor of those two uh, organisms. So in this case, it gets assigned to reptile, for example. Uh, or if you have a KMER that matches to turtle, snake, and owl, it might get assigned to the uh, a even higher taxonomic category, in this case, vertebrate. And so you do this sort of assignment for every KMER where you're assigning it to a particular uh, location or node in this taxonomic tree. And you end up with a essentially a large table of your KMERS and the classification that was assigned to that, the classification category assigned to that KMER based on your different observations. Uh, now for Kraken, the original Kraken databases and additional, uh, there is an additional data structure used called the minimizer, uh, which is essentially a way of more, it's an additional data structure on top of this table of KMERS and classifications that is used to more efficiently search through the database. Uh, a minimizer being a 
substring or like an elmer, for example, or a subkemer of a kemer uh, that is located in an, in an additional in an additional table uh, uh, where the idea with the minimizers is that you are trying to group collections of kemers that are very similar to each other into a larger and assign them a, a single identifier which makes it more efficient to search through the Kraken database. And just to compare Kraken 1 to Kraken 2, this is one of the primary locations where Kraken 2 was able to improve upon Kraken 1, mainly that Kraken 2 or Kraken 1 is storing within each record in this database, your Kamer and the least common ancestor associated with that Kamer, whereas Kraken 2 is storing in each record a, a hash code derived only from the minimi minimizer of that Kamer. Uh, so this means that records in Kraken 1, while records in Kraken 1 are uh, quite a bit larger, 96 bits, for example, records in Kraken 2 are much smaller, in this case, 32 bits, uh, which is one of the main ways that Kraken 2 uh, is able to create significantly smaller databases. But in any event, um, uh, those technical details aside, for Kraken in general, you can think of a database as a Kamer and then the assignment uh, uh, of that Kamer to a particular taxonomic category. So then when you want to assign a read to a particular taxonomic category, you would initially break up that read into all of its Kamers. And then for every Kamer, you go and look up in that Kraken database, the particular taxonomic classification label that was associated with that Kamer and basically count or count up the number of Kamers that match particular taxonomic categories in a uh, tree. And once you've done this for all the Kamers within a read, <clears throat> uh, this will uh, give you basically within the larger taxonomic tree of all organisms that you've uh, 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 integrated into the Kraken database, a subtree with only your Kamers represented at a variety of different taxonomic categories. And then the idea is that you um, classify the read itself, the taxonomic class assignment to the read itself, as being the uh, particular uh, uh, particular uh, route to path uh, that has maximal weight. So it's easier to kind of just depict it here. In this case, this read is assigned to the uh, snake category because there are three camers uh, plus one camer uh, uh, in the route to path, uh, 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 or route to leaf path. Uh, that go to snake, whereas if you went all the way to turtle, there would only be one in this turtle node and only one in the owl node. Uh, so in that way, the read itself is classified uh, uh, as a snake. And the way you can think of it is, I know it's a snake because the kamers mostly map to snake. They provide the most evidence for snake. Some kamers may map to higher taxonomic categories, but mostly they match to snake. So once you've, so this is the way you can classify or assign a taxa to an individual read. And with a metagenomic data set with millions or tens of millions of reads, you would end up with millions or tens of millions of uh, uh, taxonomic assignments. And then to, provide further interpretation of that data, there's this additional post-processing where you may want to summarize, for example, how many reads belong to different taxonomic categories and visualize this summary. Uh, and this is or can be performed from a number of different software. So Corona is one software that can be used to visualize the uh, percentage of uh, different reads and the taxonomic categories they uh, uh, are assigned to in a pie chart, hierarchical pie chart, as you can see at the right here. However, a newer software package that can do this is Pavian, uh, where 
it can, again, take as input the same Kraken report as well as input from a number of different software. And you can visualize things using either the Sankey plots as well as a number of other uh, uh, useful visualizations and tables that can help for interpretation of the taxonomic assignments of your metagenomics data set. So once you have all these taxonomic assignments, there's still the question of how do you know which taxa are the causative agent of your disease? And uh, one way you can sort this out is potentially comparing the symptoms of the pathogen with the symptoms of the disease. So if you identify a pathogen or a number of different pathogens, Within the data set, you can, using basically additional background information, such as the symptoms, uh, use that to sort out uh, potentially which pathogen uh, is the cause of that disease. Uh, however, you can also compare your data to controls. So, for example, if you have metagenomics data from uh, uh, multiple biological samples, some of which uh, come from people who uh, are infected with an unknown pathogen, and some of which come from uh, controls of people who are healthy, you could use this information as well to at least potentially narrow down which uh, pathogens are likely pre potentially causative of the disease, or what you would get is uh, uh, you can narrow down which, path which organisms are found within the uh, uh, samples from those who are who are sick uh, when compared to those who are healthy. So I did also want to mention there was a recently published paper around in well last year on uh, uh, defining a standard protocol for metagenomics analysis using Kraken, which was written by the authors of Kraken and Kraken Two. And so this uh, lists a number of different steps that can be used uh, for path pathogen identification using Kraken. So once you have your NGS reads, you can uh, remove host data by aligning to your host, such as human genome. In this case, they are recommending using POTI2 for that alignment. Uh, and then once you have the uh, reads that have been filtered uh, to remove host data. You can use Kraken or Kraken Unique to perform classifications of those reads into the different taxonomic categories, as I had described uh, in the previous slides, and then visualizing with Pavian. And in particular, in this, uh, in this protocol, if you have a collection of uh, biological samples from uh, a large number of people, which may include controls as well as those who uh, may be infected or other environmental samples that may have uh, a number of a mixture of organisms, you can use Pavian to help you identify which pathogens or at least which organisms are basically elevated in one sample compared to the other. Uh, and so in this case, they're recommending using Z scores of the read counts uh, to identify which, uh, um, basically which sets of reads assign, uh, within individual taxonomic categories are elevated in one sample over another. For example, in the protocol, which gives example data uh, for S, sample S71, uh, it looks like, for example, Ansalia Algeria, uh, and my pronunciation is pretty bad, but it looks like that is uh, likely uh, what is in that sample, uh, as you can tell from this block, which shows that there's a lot more reads of this organism in S71 and basically no reads from that organism in any of the other samples. And then they have some additional steps to extract reads associated with each taxonomic category and then align those reads back to the uh, uh, reference genome uh, for a particular organism, and then examine those alignments to just make sure that you have an even read coverage across that reference organism as a confirmation step to see if that organism is actually in your data. So this is a very nice protocol that uh, 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 gives step-by-step -step instructions on exactly which commands to run and example data if you want to investigate and do additional reading. 
uh, for our lab, we're going to do uh, right after the break, uh, we're going to actually use a different data set and a simplified version of this protocol that doesn't necessarily use all the same software uh, as listed here, uh, and which includes additional metagenomics assembly steps that are not pre present in this analysis uh, protocol.